today is Michael. The floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yes, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, a line of research that we've been kind of pursuing in, in our group for the last couple of years. And we're interested in mathematical modeling of biological systems from the scales of individual proteins all the way through populations. And in all these cases, we're interested in particular in the kind of stochastic nature of the dynamics. And can we apply ideas from statistical physics? And in the last couple of years, in particular, can we actually have some measure of control of these types of, of stochastic processes? So what I'll describe today is essentially two stories, uh, one of which is kind of controlling on the kind of larger scale, so popula entire populations of, of organisms, and the other is uh, control on the level of individual proteins, so kind of bio biochemical networks. So kind of to motivate the, the first of these stories, uh, we all know the phenomena of antibiotic resistance, right? This is basically Darwinian evolution happening at the level of, of diseases where uh, you have individual, for example, variants uh, developing which can uh, are resistant to drugs and uh, can have terrible effects on, on, on patients, right? Can spread and actually uh, lead to so-called superbugs, right? These, these multiple antibiotic resistance uh, uh, diseases. And this also happens, intriguingly, though it's a little bit less well known to the wider public, in, uh, for, for cancer therapies. In fact, um, it's estimated that the majority of cancer deaths are due to the fact that eventually, for example, certain targeted therapies uh, cease to work because you end up with variants that are resistant to that, to that therapy. So this is a major problem in, in medicine and people in, in the last couple of years are trying to essentially figure out ways of, of mitigating this problem. You can't turn it off completely. You can't make Darwinian evolution cease, but perhaps there are ways of steering evolution in directions that are, you know, make the disease more treatable. Like if you know there's a particular variant that and you have a particular drug that works for that variant really, really well, perhaps if you can take a mixed population and steer it towards a population with that particular variant, um, then you have a, a methodology of treatment. But that kind of uh, begs the question of how do you do this steering in the first place? So we need to develop methods to kind of fundamentally understand how do you take a stochastic population, stochastic system and control it and to arrive at a given destination in a finite time, right? Because we can't do this kind of quasi statically because we need to do this at this at, on time levels of actual treatments. So if you have a population of various genetic variants, uh, and these of course could be, I'm gonna focus on genetic variants here, but you can imagine this could also be equally applicable to things like epigenetic changes. Um, how do you steer it? Well, there are several different processes going on in this population. Uh, cells, let's focus on single celled organisms. Uh, th these cells are, are dividing at, at certain rates. Um, those rates, the fitnesses may depend on your environmental conditions. So it may depend on the concentration of a given drug and different variants might have different fitnesses under different drugs. Cells die. When, when cells uh, uh, replicate, they also can mutate, right? So you have a different a population of these various types. And essentially, from the perspective of control, your control knobs are your fitnesses, which will be dependent on, these, on some control parameters. We're going to focus on drug concentrations. Um, this could be a single drug, which is the simplest case. It could be a cocktail of different drugs. But it could be a, a various other things as well, nutrients, environmental parameters, anything that basically can affect the fitness of your uh, uh, individual variants. So um, how do you describe such a, such a system? Well, we're gonna, uh, throughout this, we're gonna use actually ratios of these fitnesses. So we're gonna choose one type to be kind of the reference type, we'll call it the wild type, and we'll have a ratio of the fitnesses to that uh, uh, wild type fitness minus one. We'll call that a selection coefficient. Um, and uh, what you end up doing eventually is building a mathematical model, which is quite familiar, and, and, and we've seen it in, in many of the talks uh, in this conference, which is essentially a Fokker-Planck description of the system. So you have, if you have M types, you're going to define an M minus one dimensional vector. This is just a fraction, you know, each component of the vector is the fraction of that type in the population. The last fraction, everything has to sum to one, so the last fraction you don't need to keep track of, that's automatically uh, uh, known through normalization. And you end up with a multidimensional Fokker Planck. Uh, and this equation essentially has two major components. There is this kind of uh, uh, velocity term, or, or what we would call in stat make the drift term, um, which consists of two uh, contributions. One comes from mutations, 
So there's a mutation matrix that describes possible transitions between the different types. It's kind of like a, essentially a, a transition matrix in, in, a, in a Markov system. And the other part is essentially the, the role of, of fitness. So this is where these selection coefficients S, J come into play. Each of them might depend on a time varying, for example, drug concentration. And then what translates selection coefficient into your velocity is this matrix G, um, which is given here. And that matrix is also proportional to the, your diffusion matrix and essentially captures the nature, the, the kind of randomness of, of the evolutionary process. So if you have finite populations, if your total population size N is quite small, you're going to have a fairly large amount of randomness just because of finite you know, uh, population sampling from generation to generation. Right, and that's your that's your underlying model. And the question is, okay, you 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 give some, you have some uh, uh, given system. You know the types, you know the fitnesses, you know how the fitnesses depend on drugs. You're going to get some kind of dynamics. Um, your probability distributions will change in time. But can we now shepherd those distributions over uh, a chosen trajectory? Um, and in particular, because uh, as I'll as I'll explain in, in a couple of slides, we're going to be thinking about a, a methodology known as counterdiabetic driving, where we're trying to shepherd over trajectories that are you know, uh, equilibrium trajectories, we can imagine that associated with every single parameter, let's say drug concentration, there's gonna be a given equilibrium distribution of our, of our genotypes. So this would be, this is for example, in this cartoon, a three type uh, uh, system. So you're, we're basically living on a two dimensional probability simplex and the distributions are just basically distributions on this simplex. So as we change drug, for example, we go from you know, this distribution on the right this distribution on the left. We can also characterize it by the mean genotype frequencies in each case. Um, and so we have this kind of trajectory in probability space. And the question is, can we actually force the system to follow a particular trajectory? And that trajectory might be chosen for um, you know, medical purposes, but here it's just kind of a, a, a generic problem of, can we force the system onto, onto a trajectory? Um, we're gonna focus initially on this trajectory just being a sequence of equilibrium distributions, but I'll show later that we can generalize these methods to kind of arbitrary distributions as well that are not necessarily uh, equilibrium ones. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take advantage of the close parallels which the Fokker-Planck equation has with the Schrodinger equation, right? So um, there's been a series of, of really nice uh, uh, approaches developed in the context of quantum computing, in particular quantum adiabatic computation, where you're interested in controlling quantum states. And, I'm, and I'll, I'll describe how we can do this analogously for, for classical systems. But in the quantum case, you're often, you're interested in, you start at a given, uh, let's say you start at a very simply prepared ground state and you do some kind of manipulation of your system. So you're, for example, changing local magnetic fields and you wanna prepare some quite complicated uh, uh, final uh, state, which is the ground state under your final configuration of the fields. And we know from the qu quantum adiabatic theorem that if you do this change infinitesimally slowly, you will end up at your um, and, uh, uh, at your desired target state. But at any uh, you know uh, finite speed of doing this, you there's a chance that you're going to end up excite going to an excited state or going to a superposition of excited and ground states. Um, so you, there's a price to pay. You're not going to be necessarily at, at your desired state. So in the early 2000s, uh, uh, a variety of researchers, um, including Barry, Demerflack, and Rice, developed a, a kind of approach called counterdiabatic driving, where what you're essentially doing is adding an additional perturbation to your Hamiltonian in order to force the system to be in the ground state of your original system at all times, even if you're doing this at, at finite speeds, which is really nice from a computational perspective. You wanna arrive at your answer in finite time. And in our case, you know, when we're manipulating these classical uh, biological systems, we also want to get at the desired uh, end goal in, in, in a finite time. Um, so how does the analogy work? Well, in the quantum case, we had the target trajectory was basically a sequence of ground states uh, for each field configuration. Here, we're going to be thinking about a sequence of equilibrium uh, genotype distributions. And the control protocol there was perhaps maybe a, per uh, uh, often it's a very complicated uh, perturbation, could in, potentially non-local. Um, here, we're going to hope that our control protocol is somehow implementable in the system, and it's just going to essentially going to be a modified drug concentration over time um, that will allow us to basically hit this, this target trajectory. Um, and the, the general prescription of doing this is, uh, is what we showed in, 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 in this first paper. Now, let me give you a, a, a concrete example. So this is going to be a 
Uh, this was a system of, of, of yeast that was actually developed to study anti uh, uh, malarial drug resistance. So what they did is they put a malarial DHFR gene into the yeast, and there are 16 possible variants of this, of this gene, which you can think of as uh, you're going to enumerate them as kind of bit strings. So the wild type gene where there are no mutations is just zero, 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 because there are four possible places where you can mutate. And then if you have a mutation or location, you just put a one there, right? So you have 16 possible um, alternative, you know, different mutants going from zero, 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 all the way through one, 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 one. Each of these individual mutants um, under a particular antimalarial drug called perimethamine um, has a certain growth rate, which you can actually measure experimentally. So each one of these curves is for one of these mutants, the growth rate, or we can think of this in, in our model terms as fitness, as a function of drug concentration. And you can see it's a quite complicated curve, right? Things that are uh, fit under low drug are not necessarily fit under, under high drug. Um, and then associated with every single, uh, if you fix the concentration, your system will go into an equilibrium evolutionary state, right? So this, for example, here, this tesseract that I'm showing here, the circles are proportional to the population. And this is, would be an equilibrium state under a very low drug concentration. And you can imagine what's, what's going to happen now if I start a low drug concentration and suddenly uh, uh, push it up. So if you were to do this numerically, so you choose a certain drug dosage, we start from low, we go up to some um, uh, high value. What you would see in the system is, um, in the, which is shown in the solid curves here, uh, uh, a change in the various free, uh, genotype frequencies as a function of, of time. And what I'm showing in the dashed lines are the corresponding equilibrium uh, uh, concentrations or fre frequencies at each individual time step, right? And you can see as typical of the system, if I, if I drive it out of equilibrium, it's going to lag behind um, the instantaneous equilibrium uh, concentrations, the dashed lines, and not exactly follow it. Eventually, if I wait long enough, it will reach those, those instantaneous equilibrium ones. But in between at intermediate times, there's going to be this discrepancy between between the two systems. So, um, and you, here, so this is, this is at, 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 the, at, this, at a small time, you can see this transition happening over here, where the differences in colors here represents the differences between actual and, uh, and equilibrium. And, uh, you know, so there's this, this kind of period here where things are not precisely following the track that we wanted to. So the question is, can we get it to follow that track um, and can we get do this for all 15 uh, uh, genotype frequencies here? Um, the answer, it turns out, you could, there's a closed form solution, which is which is uh, we were quite surprised by. Um, now, this particular solution works in the large population limit, in the limit of, of fast mutations. Um, and you can express essentially the perturbed selection coefficients in terms of your original ones, plus a function of time, um, where these X bars here are the mean genotype frequencies for your equilibrium distributions as a function of your original protocol. So then the question is in terms of implementation is finding the drug protocol that corresponds to these perturbed uh, selection coefficients. And in this system, and we, we tried a couple of other uh, similar systems, it shows you can do this quite well. So for example, that drug protocol for this particular system looks like now this red curve here. It has a spike in, uh, uh, in the middle. You cut it off at a particular maximum dosage because there are certain limits, physiological limits, to what kind of dosages you, you, you can give to a system. Of course, these are all numerical simulations, but we want to you know, keep it as, as realistic as possible. And you can see that with this now modified drug protocol, you're following your instantaneous equilibrium curves quite well. And I've shown only the top four genotypes, but this actually holds true for, for, for all, all 15. Uh, so uh, you can actually implement these things, at least on a numerical level, um, in these types of, of evolutionary systems. And what's also really nice about this system, this is all so far uh, uh, theoretical, um, is that this particular yeast system is something that is actually, uh, um, has been developed in, in, in the experimental context. So we have a collaborator, Kerry Samarad at Arizona State, who's working to directly implement these same kind of protocols. And we can actually see if we can, you know, these numerically predicted uh, modified dosages, will they actually work as well in the, uh, in the experimental context? Right, so we're, this, is the, this is kind of ongoing work um, uh, as part of this collaboration. So everything that I've described so far has kind of focused on, 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 on evolution, but these ideas are, are fairly general, right? So they don't necessarily, you know, essentially any stochastic biological system um, is potentially amenable to, this, to these types of catabatic uh, control ideas. 
And so the, the second story that I'm going to tell you is going to be kind of focusing on the other on the other other scale of things. So looking at biochemical reaction networks. And here, rather than thicknesses, what we're changing essentially are concentrations of chemical species, and those concentrations influence transition rates in in some kind of uh, uh, reaction network system. Now, I'll, this is a in this particular system I'll explain a little bit later is essentially a system of of for example chaperones binding to to proteins. Um, but in general, what we have as control knobs now are these external chemical concentrations, and our control targets are going to be: Can we shepherd the system through a set of, prob of, of a probability distribution, distribution of system states and as, as in a sequence of these probability distributions? Um, now, here we're going to kind of broaden our scope a little bit. So we focus primarily in the evolutionary case on just shepherding through uh, uh, equilibrium. Uh, uh, concentrations, but what if we now, you know, are, are basically allow non-equilibrium uh, trajectories as well? And what if, in some cases, we also are not interested in, in controlling every single state in the system? What if we only want to focus on a particular uh, subset of states and only control that, those, that, that subset? So um, we can then distinguish between local control, we're only controlling some of the, of, of, of the states versus global control. And we can also think about whether these trajectories necessarily have to be instantaneous stationary distributions. And it turns out that for this biochemical network system, for this discrete Markov uh, approach, um, you can find solutions to all of these uh, individual problems. But let's start with the traditional uh, problem, which is basically global control where your targets are uh, instantaneous stationary targets. Um, so what you're doing, I'm not going to go into the complete technical details here, but what you're effectively doing is you start with a Markov model for you for your system. You have transition uh, uh, matrices describing your your rates. They depend on some kind of external parameters, lambda, and uh, you have an underlying master equation that describes the system, and then you have some target probability uh, trajectory vector. This is what you want the system to behave at uh, in a particular uh, uh, time duration. And for the traditional problem, the catalytic problem, this target probability trajectory is essentially a right eigenvector of your transition matrix uh, because it's a, it's a stationary uh, uh, trajectory. And what you're essentially looking for is a modified transition matrix that where this row is now a solution to your master equation. So in effect, what you're doing is you're inverting the master equation. Normally, you start with with omega and you and you and you try to find p. Here we have the row and we're trying to find an omega tilde that does this, this driving. And it turns out that um, using some of the you know, kind of standard tools that have been applied for, for uh, you know, to these Markovian systems, so graph theory ideas, um, you can come up with a general graphical algorithm to completely enumerate all possible solutions uh, 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 to this inverse problem. And in fact, what's, what's really interesting, at least to us, maybe it's, you know, in hindsight, it's, it's, it's obvious, but uh, we were a little bit surprised when we first saw it, is that Overall, this is, uh, uh, you know, you can have infinitely many such solutions, and many of them uh, can be actually physically realizable. And in particular for graphs with loops, generically, you're going to have uh, infinitely uh, many solutions. Um, let me just give you an example of, of this in a very simple system that's well characterized. So this is a three-state biochemical network of a, a repressor and a co-repressor binding to a gene um, and essentially turning it off. Um, this is from uh, this experimental study where we know all of the individual transition rates and how things depend on concentrations. You have three concentrations in the system, that of the repressor, the co-repressor, and they're complex when they, when they bind together. And you can set up a, uh, a, a basic Markovian description where let's say you change concentrations of these things uh, uh, over time. You have some associated equilibrium uh, uh, probabilities uh, uh, trajectory uh, that you want to now have the target of the system, and you're interested in, okay, well, if I just directly apply this and I directly solve the, the mass equation, I'm going to get this characteristic lag. I'm not going to uh, follow the equilibrium trajectory, but now I can add a perturbation to the concentrations to basically get it exactly on target. This is one solution. For example, this is another solution. Both of these concentration profiles give you, give you exactly the same probability behavior, and in fact, there's an infinite family of such profiles that can be enumerated using, using our approach. And you can actually begin to do interesting things. You can act, ask, begin to ask questions like, among all these individual concentration profiles that all hit the same target sequence, which is the one that minimizes entropy production at every single time step? Um, and so you can find an optimal, you know, this is entropy production as a function of time. You can find the trajectory that, that, 
that optimizes that. And so you have, for example, this concentration set of concentration profiles is optimal from that sense. And you can imagine other types of uh, objective functions that you want to optimize um, among this entire family of, of, of possible control solutions. And that's something that we're, we're also actively looking at. What are the, what are the characteristics of these types of, of optimal solutions? Um, but this is just so far, everything here is now just equilibrium targets. What if we wanted to make this completely general? So the most general version that you can imagine here would be to say, okay, I don't necessarily want things to be in equilibrium um, or instantaneous equilibrium uh, at, at, all, at all time steps. And I'm only interested in maybe just a subset of these individual states. So let's say there are NT of these states that I wanna control. And so I specify the functions rho one through rho NT of those states that I'm interested in controlling. And the other ones, the other probabilities can be arbitrary. We'll call those pi. And let's say in this problem, maybe there are only a subset of the individual edges in, in the network that I can actually uh, um, control, right? Because maybe I only have a, a, a finite number of chemical species that influence these, these edges. Um, so if we look at this, the network of, uh, in this case, it's a probability current network. Um, I'm, and I'll sh the, in dark red are the ones, for example, that, that can be controlled. Um, and light red are the ones that you have no influence over, right? So you have this finite subset of, of edges that are controllable. Um, and then the dark blue states are the ones that, you're that you have particular functions that you want those states uh, to obey. So for a given problem like this, um, there it turns out to be a solution. It's a, it's a somewhat more complicated than just the standard quadratic solution. But um, what's, what's nice there, there's a, there's a fairly easy result that actually tells you if a solution is possible at all. Um, and this is um, what we call kind of a local control criterion. And in order to figure this out, what you do is essentially uh, construct target subgraphs. So for every single one of your uh, states that you're interested in controlling, you look at the subgraph of uh, other states that are connected via controllable edges, and you enumerate those subgraphs, right? So you, you construct all those subgraphs uh, uh, for your given network. And the criterion states that local control is possible if every single such target subgraph has at least one non-target non state, right? Um, and one particular consequence of this is, for example, if, if your number of edges that, you're, that, you, uh, that you are available for control is smaller than the number of states that you are trying to control, that's, uh, it's, that's gonna be impossible. Um, uh, but this is essentially a, a nice criteria where even without doing a, a, a calculations, you can immediately just uh, read off whether local control is possible. Um, so this, for example, this is another example. In this case, it would not be possible because this target state that you're interested in controlling the target subgraph just has no non-target non uh, states in it. Okay, so let me try to illustrate this with a particular <clears throat> biological example um, to show you that in some sense that this, it, it can actually help us rationalize some of the things that nature may be doing, um, not just ways in which experimentalists can go and control uh, biological systems, but perhaps ways in which nature regulates itself. Um, and this is the example of, of chaperone-assisted uh, protein folding. Um, so, Proteins uh, tend to misfold um, uh, with some small probability, um, but this could be actually a major problems uh, for cells if these, if these misfolded proteins end up aggregating. Um, and this, this tendency is actually exacerbated when you go to higher and higher temperatures. Um, so what you need essentially is a way to, to solve, you know, to basically fix this problem. Um, and this is, uh, the, the, one way of doing this is essentially through chaperone proteins. What these proteins do is basically bind to misfold the proteins and uh, uh, catalyze their unfolding, perhaps into an intermediate state, perhaps into a native state, but essentially allows you a, another chance to fold, fold correctly. Um, what's interesting about this is that it's a, it's a, it's a natural non-equilibrium stationary state that, that develops from here because um, this catalysis step typically involves uh, some kind of energy usage, for example, uh, ATP hydrolysis, um, oftentimes, it's actually several ATP at once that to complete a single cycle. And so you can actually study the, the non-equilibrium stationary distributions that arise uh, from these types of chaperone networks. Uh, the other interesting aspect of them is that uh, under optimal growth conditions, there's just enough chaperones typically to deal with the normal level of misfolded proteins, right? So it's kind of like you're building a hospital and you just have enough capacity for the typical uh, um, patient load. But suddenly if, you, if the cell goes into a new condition, for example, you go into a high temperature environment, you go into a heat shock, 
you have a lot more misfolded proteins, you have a lot more wounded patients, you need to basically dynamically and very quickly build up your hospital to upregulate your, your concentration of, of, of chaperones. Um, and this is what happens. Uh, if, experimentally, if you look at, uh, this is examples from two different organisms, from yeast and E. coli, um, you essentially, in the minutes after the start of your heat shock, so this is a yeast, for example, subjected to 39 degree heat shock. Um, this is a proxy for, uh, for, for, for the number of chaperones. These are the expressions of genes associated with chaperone proteins. And you can see in some cases almost a twofold increase in, in, in the expression of those chaperone genes after the heat shock. And you also see this typical where it increases very rapidly in the beginning and then kind of levels off, um, which we'll re return to a little bit later. For E. coli, you have similar uh, uh, kind of a similar story. This black curve here is the uh, expression of a, of a chaperone gene. Um, and then for E. coli, additionally, you also have this transient peak in ATP concentration, which again, I'll, I'll return to a little bit uh, earlier. It's not a universal uh, property of these chaper chaperone systems, but E. coli does show this also transient increase in, in ATP. Um, so can we take a look at these in experimental kind of observations? Can we rationalize them in the language of, of this local control theory? So if we build up a kind of simple model of what's going on, um, so this is kind of a two-loop model for, for these chaperones. Um, in, one, in, in the simplest case, you essentially have in this network only a single edge that you can actually control, right? And that's essentially the edge going from misfolded to, to, to chaperone because that's dependent on the chaperone concentration. So if you have such an edge, what can you do with this type of system? So you write it as a four-state Markov model. Um, and it turns out that with this one controllable edge, if your target state is the probability of misfolded protein, so you want to, let's say, reduce that probability you know, very quickly. So at, at the beginning of heat shock, it may be very large, and you want to get it down to something very small and follow it you know, a very sharp, for example, sigmoidal uh, 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 downturn. Then with that single controllable edge, you can actually do this. So you can actually fulfill local control here of that, of that target state. Um, and you can do that, but you can't control precisely any other thing. So for example, if I wanted to control you know, native state probability with that single edge, I couldn't do that, right? Um, so in this type of, with these types of control knobs, you can get rid of misfolded proteins, but you don't, can't necessarily arbitrarily quickly make an increase in the rise uh, in, the, in the probability of, of native proteins. Um, what about for the E. coli case? Let's say you have control of both chaperone concentration, you can upregulate that, and you can also change ATP concentration. Well, that gives you actually now two controllable edges. And now you can have actually two target states. Um, so you can control both the misfolded probability and the probability of the misfolded binding to the, the chaperone. Why would you want to do that? Well, in the previous case, um, because you didn't control this probability number two, you actually get a transient accumulation of chaperone um, uh, on the misfolded proteins. But let's say you want to reuse these as quickly as possible. So you want to get rid of that, that transient uh, accumulation. Well, now if you have the second control uh, uh, knob, you can actually get rid of that, 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 that hump. So you can actually control both states one and two uh, uh, directly. So it allows you basically to reuse, to recycle these, these, these chaperones as quickly as possible um, uh, in this process. Right? So this is not a, you know, this is not a direct quantitative one-to-one uh, -one mapping to these uh, to these networks because the underlying networks are, are a bit more complicated than a simple example, but it does illustrate, you know, that some of these ideas in some sense in a qualitative way um, can help us understand how nature uh, potentially regulates itself. Uh, so the, again, like I said, these ideas are fairly general, so we're working on ways to extend it to things like developmental biology, um, uh, to ecology, uh, but where I wanted to kind of leave off at is the, the kind of a, the challenge uh, going forward in trying to kind of translate these kind of control ideas um, from the kind of quantum context into the classical one. Um, everything I've described to you so far really depends on a detailed information about, uh, about fitnesses um, in the evolutionary case or about the underlying Markovian networks uh, uh, in the biochemical case. Um, what can we do in the absence of detailed fitness information? Because oftentimes it's actually very laborious. Like the experiments to set up and actually measure all of these individual growth rates versus concentration, this is actually a fairly uh, um, uh, time-consuming uh, series of experiments. And this is just for four, po you know, four possible mutations. It becomes combinatorially really, really hard to do this for much more complicated systems. Um, so one potential solution would be to, instead of trying to control the entire distribution of, of, of uh, genotypes or system states, 
perhaps focus on you know means of those kind of macro you know in, in the quantum context this is something like macro state versus uh, micro state control so you're trying to you have less control of the system but perhaps it's it's more easy to implement and the other thing that we're that, that we're looking at is using um, techniques from machine learning for example reinforcement learning things like that to dynamically learn underlying fitness models that will enable this type of, of, of control, right? When, when we have uh, uh, imperfect information. So we basically may start with a system, we give it uh, you know, small perturbations, small changes in, in drug, and from the response of the system to those drug changes, learn its fitness landscape, and then uh, 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 try to uh, then control the system from, from that point. Um, with that, um, I thank my collaborators on, on, the, on this project, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, uh, thank you very, very much, Michael. Um, if there's anybody else with questions, if you could please raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, we have two in the chat. The very first one was from uh, Megan Engel. Uh, Megan, if you're there, do you want to um, unmute and um, uh, videoize yourself, whatever the word would be, and ask your question? Sure. Yeah, it was just a just a little thing. Um, you may have mentioned it. Thanks for the talk, by the way. This was so cool. Um, yeah, so you may have, might have mentioned it, but what was the motivation kind of medically, biologically, for trying to maintain those yeast gene? I think it was yeast. I can't remember. The one where there were 16 different uh, mm -hmm. mutations. What's the motivation for wanting to maintain them in their equilibrium distribution? Because it seemed like at the very end, they got there anyway, whether or not they lagged. Yeah. So like, so, why? Yeah, why? Yeah. So there, there are two kind of motivations. So one is, yeah, you're right. If, if it's if it's the target is an equilibrium uh, uh, state, um, ultimately, then it's the question of getting to that target quicker. Right. So uh, that's the first motivation is getting to, you know, uh, equilibrating these systems much more quickly. So you get to the final distribution that you're interested in um, uh, more quickly. But why why maintain equilibrium in, in the middle? Right. Maybe you can Fine. There are easier solutions where you go off the equilibrium uh, um, uh, manifold um, uh, at intermediate times. Um, there, that's actually a totally valid question. One of the advantages of doing these things, uh, mimicking equilibrium, is if there's any interruption in your protocol, right? Something, you know, treatment is interrupted in some way. Um, if you are at any intermediate point in an equilibrium distribution, you're guaranteed to stay there. So in some sense, it's robust to interruptions. You can return to the system later on and continue uh, uh, manipulating it. Um, but the general question is, I mean, this is something that we're interested in. There are, there are whole sets of techniques in quantum control called fast forward techniques um, where you don't necessarily maintain equilibrium in, in the middle. Um, and those in principle should also be doable for, for the evolutionary case. We can definitely do them for the, in, with our approach with the biochemical networks. So there we don't necessarily have to stay in equilibrium at all. Um, so, John, I think you've got a, um, a related question. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, you, you, you've at least partially or maybe mostly answered the question, but it was that that you wouldn't necessarily have to specify in advance what the trajectory is in between. Like, if you want to get to some final final state and you start from an initial state, you could say, well, I just want to get there in some time, and maybe I put some constraints on where the trajectories are allowed to go in general, but I don't try to specify and that that can give you more freedom and and you know you were you were talking about optimal uh, uh protocol yeah, yeah. so you presumably do even better than your optimum i guess yeah and that's and one of the interesting questions that that we have about these systems is is the relationship of these types of approaches to the more traditional kind of control theory uh approaches um uh you know in generically how how far are these counter back solutions from you know, generic optimal, you know, solutions for optimizing a particular uh, objective function. That's something that we're also uh, uh, looking into in, in, in terms of follow-up pap papers. Um, but it's a, it's, yeah, these are, these are all interesting questions. At, at some level, we, we, we took the, we started with the lowest hanging fruit because when the, 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 the trajectory is specified and when it's in this, this instantaneous equilibrium, you can actually have these really nice closed form solutions for, for the control protocol, even in these very high dimensional cases. Um, and so that kind of excited us as, as, a, as a kind of a starting point. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, thanks. So we have uh, three raised hands and in the sequence, I believe, was uh, Sar first, then uh, Jonathan, and then um, Gabriel. Uh, okay. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for the talk, Mike. Let's see if my camera operates. So just kind of a small question. Uh, 
Is there any particular cost to trying to control things too fast? Do you have some trade-offs? Uh, maybe you have to dissipate more if you try to change things fast, or if you go beyond some internal time scales, you can't really do it. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. There, there are both. Uh, there are both trade-offs and 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 limits. Um, uh, we've seen these in individual systems. So if you look at individual biochemical networks, generically speaking, for example, entry production, there's going to be a trade-off. You know, the faster you try to do things, you know, the more entry production that is is going to be involved. Um, uh, the more you'll be also, uh, you'll be forced to be further and further away from um, uh, uh, detailed balance. Uh, uh, so we don't we don't yet have a kind of a completely generic uh, formulation of this. So we what, what we would love to do is something like you know a thermodynamic speed limit type type formulation for for these evolutionary systems. And and we think that there are already a, a, a several different approaches that people have used these for classical systems. We think some many of those can translate into the evolutionary case, but we have yet to to fully formulate that. But you're totally right. There will be trade offs. Um, things so in terms of like for example uh, one of the most interesting ones medically would be uh, drug uh, uh, doses so oftentimes you look at what what they call area under the curve so you're basically integrating your drug concentration over the duration of, of of the protocol and let's say you want to go faster presumably you're going to have to have larger overall drug dosages and that's gonna there's gonna be a fundamental limit there because um, you're not allowed to for example give delta function. Uh, drug dosages to patients, <laughs> um, generally frowned upon, uh, uh, and uh, and there will also be limits, as you said, fundamentally because certain rates may be not controllable and may basically set kind of be rate limiting steps overall in 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 your in your system. Um, all of these things, in terms of the kind of general formulation, I think are really interesting questions. Thank you, Jonathan. You're up now. Uh uh, hi, Michael. Th thank you so much for the great talk. Um, near near the end, you were saying one of the it's, it seemed like you were saying one of the big drawbacks is just the the need to know a lot of the actual rates of the underlying model you you want to deal with, and sometimes that's just very hard to to get. Um, it, is there is, is is there any thoughts on doing any sort of like entropic inference like maximum entry methods where you have just some information about the whole model but you don't have all the information and then, so then you just try to use sort of maximum entropy to, to to fill in the information that you don't have to the best of your ability um i think yeah that certainly sound i mean we haven't specifically looked at at, at, at that uh approach but it, it certainly sounds like it's it should be you know it's one thing that, that, that that's a that's a possible solution. Um, essentially, any um, we haven't figured out for these for these specific problems uh, here, um, which exact. I mean, there's so many different possible. You know, there there's so many people approaches people have have developed from you know kind of purely black box machine learning through something a little bit more informed like like this these kind of maximum entry approaches. Uh, we haven't yet figured out what's the most practically. Uh, uh, useful or, or successful one of these, but this is something that, that, that we're working on. Thank you very much. Okay, and then to finish off today's um, WASP, you're up, Gabriel. Yes, um, thank you for this nice talk. Um, you mentioned at the end uh, that you plan to use a machine learning technique like reinforcement learning. Could you give more details about that? Um, yeah, so you can imagine uh, you can imagine this almost like playing a game, right? So let's say, and, and this is actually going to be quite relevant um, uh, if, if you know this is at this level. This is all, of course, still pure theory. But let's imagine some kind of blue sky future um, where you are trying to do this kind of individually cater a therapy to a patient. So a patient walks in your door. That patient, even if you know the average you know behavior of of of, of, of a populate of a population in terms of that particular disease. Um, each individual patient is its own environment and will have its own or, or his or her own uh, kind of un underlying fitness landscape. Now, you're not going to go and measure these growth rates of various, you know, uh, disease variants in the patient's own environment. That's impossible, right? All you can do is essentially give the patient a pill and, and, and then maybe, you know, through biopsy or some, or, or, or some kind of like over time uh, have individual uh, data points where you're measuring the response of the, of the patient uh, to that pill. So um, a biopsy may give you essentially uh, a distribution of possible types. 
Um, you give the pill, you give, so I say a small drug concentration, a week, two weeks later, you again measure the distribution effect, you see how it's changed. From that single time step, you make the best, you, you kind of try to infer the, the best model. And that might be like, like the previous question through some kind of like uh, parsimony in terms of like entry ma maximization. Um, or you can imagine just giving this to like, like a machine learning, like a reinforcement learning algorithm, um, just the way like machines can learn how to play Go or chess without even knowing the rules beforehand. Um, essentially, the, 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 machine the machine is learning the rules, which are the fitness landscape as it, as it goes along. Um, so for that single time step, maybe it builds a very uh, bad model. And now you give a, you know, but, and you then perturb it again. You, give it, you, you increase maybe the dosage or you switch drug. Um, and now you have two time, you have two time points that, that, that you've measured. And so gradually you get, you build a better and better model. The, the machine is able to infer more and more about the landscape. And then hopefully does that fast enough to get a good control algorithm going to get you the target um, before bad things happen. For example, patient dies. Um, so that would be in some sense, the a, a kind of the, the rough picture of what this would look like. But it's, it's an interesting problem because it's not like, teaching like a, a self-driving car uh, where you, you're allowed to basically run a thousand different trials and the car goes off a cliff, right? This is learning, you have, it's like one shot learning where you have, to, you have to succeed for this patient. You can't, you don't have an ensemble of a thousand patients uh, to, to work with where you can kill off half of them. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting kind of learning problem. Thank you. Okay, well, Thank you, everybody. If uh, anybody for any of today's talks has more um, questions that occur to them, then uh, you can get the email addresses of people. Um, uh, confirm agreeing with Sar, seconding his sentiment. And um, I'll see everybody tomorrow then, I guess. Bye.